That was great. Thank you so much. Now it's my pleasure to welcome another friend of Food Tank. It's like all of my good friends are coming and just hanging out, and it makes me uh, feel really excited. Um, so I, I'm really thrilled to have Julie Coonan here from Oatly. She uh, is the Director of Sustainability for North America, um, and she's someone I admire because she's been involved in so many different aspects of the food system, from academia to um, politics to all of, you know to research to all of these different things. She's so knowledgeable about how things work and don't work. And so I'm so excited to have you here. And um, so, you know, we, we had a, a long discussion about what, what we should entitle this panel. And so I'm wondering, you know, if we can talk about, can companies regenerate agriculture? Is, is that even possible? Is that a thing? <laughs> is that a thing? I don't know. Yeah. I actually loved that you posed that question that way. And part of the reason I love it is because we got to be a little bit contrarian in our answer and say, well, no. Yeah. Which, you know, you want me to say, sure, of course, and here's what <laughs> we're going to do. And we'll talk about what we're going to do. Um, you know, the agriculture system, as every speaker that you've been hearing from this week, it's a complex and integrated and sort of interwoven system. I think companies have an essential role to play, and I'm sure we'll talk a lot about what Oatly is doing as part of that system. But because it's a system, I mean, every lever has to be moving. Mm -hmm. And there's policy pieces, and there's banking pieces, and there's agronomy and research pieces, and there's um, advocacy pieces, and then there's like market and consumer and the products that we make kinds of pieces. So we have that role to play, and this is a system that has to be moving towards transformation together. So, Absolutely. you know, it's either a no or it's a like yes and. <laughs> yeah, no, I think everything's a yes and. So what is Oatly doing on this front then? Yeah, fantastic. Um, so for folks who don't know, I mean, Oatly is a, the original plant milk company, oat milk company. Um, we are striving to present a set of products to the world that are solutions to the climate crisis. So we recognize the world is in crisis. We recognize that um, the agricultural system is responsible for about a third of greenhouse gas emissions um, and that it takes inordinate amounts of land and water and other resources on the planet. So people eat all the time and want to be able to make good delicious choices with their foods and so we're trying to present a food that is in itself a solution to the problem. Um, so you know we generally think that plant-based foods are you know less resource intensive than animal-based equivalents so our whole modus operandi is to shift dairy consumption of you know, cow milk to plant milk, um, and in doing so, save a huge amount of greenhouse gas emissions. To do that, we want to be part of a regenerative farming system, and that's what we're working towards. Why are oats special? They're delicious. They're good for <laughs> you. No, they have a lot of qualities. Um, they're generally speaking a crop that's farmed without irrigation, so they're very water saving. They are generally speaking a crop that is grown without a lot of chemical inputs. They can be grown in many different ecosystems. So for example, here in North America, the market that I work in, we grow them either in the US or Canada. So we don't have to ship them all over the world. Um, you know, They don't come with that carbon footprint. And they're also a crop that works really, really well in rotation with right. other crops. And so you know, it's part of diversifying the cycle breaking up pest cycles, um, contributing, you know, in, in sort of soil and formation and water quality, but it's also providing farmers with other crop options and other markets. And that's a huge, like the market piece for farmers and the economic viability of the system for farmers is a really key piece. It's allowing farmers in a lot of ways to go back to the diverse systems we used to see 150 years ago. Yeah, I mean, and even beyond that, and I think I need to acknowledge that, um, you know, the original farmers on this planet who were First Nations and other indigenous sure. peoples farmed in harmony with the planet, and they grew, you know, in a vast diversity of crops. And I think we need to acknowledge that farmers of color, indigenous people, are the originators of what we're today calling regenerative farming. Right. Um, so there's a recognition and a respect for the fact that, you know, nature knows what it's doing, right? We broke up the soil with mechanized farming, with chemicals, with all these things. And there are ways to recover that by introducing diversity back into the system and lowering that load of chemicals and synthetic fossil fuel-based inputs. Well, and lowering that diversity, you mentioned it before, also lowers the amount of pests and pathogens, which we talked about earlier today. 
Yeah, I mean, I think you don't have to be an ecologist. I, I happen to have somewhat of a background in ecology. But I mean, everybody knows that if you grow all of the same thing at all of the same time, it's like the buffet for the pests, right? right. So you need to break up those systems um, and, you know, kind of take out and give back different pieces because it's a very complex puzzle. Absolutely. For someone with a, a strong academic and research background, yeah. I wonder that shift to the private sector must have been sort of like a switch you had to turn. <laughs> it's like a mind-blowing shift. Yeah, so I mean, as you alluded to, I started my career in academia. I worked in the federal government for a long time. I worked in nonprofit. I kind of came at food and sustainability from all these different perspectives. And for me, what I finally sort of concluded, and I, I think some of the earlier speakers talked about it, is, you know, the market moves things, right? People's consumer choices um, and the market and the sort of capitalist economic framework that we live in is what drives change on this planet. And so I decided, for me personally, I just, I wanted to go inside that beast and like yeah. try to move things from inside. And to do that in a company that's mission driven to begin with, like to me is a little bit the best of both worlds. So I think that a private sector company and certainly a company like Oatly and our fellow like alt food companies, you know, has tremendous power and potential to make yeah. the changes that we all know that are needed. Yeah, I mean, and we need to do them quickly. The urgency is there and we can talk about that later. One of the things that I wanted to ask was, I think, eaters and maybe people in this audience are confused about the term regenerative agriculture. And there are lots of, le lots of different uh, definitions out there. I'm wondering how Oatly and you define it and are those things different? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a contested topic. It's a contested term. And I do think that there is confusion because there is no consensus definition. It's still very much a, sort of a platform that is being um, debated and sort of crystallized in various kinds of language. We actually went through a, like a six to eight month long process of consulting with experts and going within our company and all of the different pieces that need to be involved because there's, there's farming, there's processing, there's manufacturing, you know, our whole supply chain for, you know, a bucket term. Um, you know, we took a very careful look at that and then took a look at our own values as a company and mm -hmm. said, okay, how, where are we coming out on this in terms of a definition for regenerative agriculture? So for us, we have committed to investing in regenerative systems that have three primary qualities. They're going to reduce overall net greenhouse gas emissions, um, they're going to improve ecosystem health, and they're going to support farm viability and resilience. So those are three kind of main buckets. I think they're really critical buckets. And if I can just maybe call out a couple of things specific to each of those is in the net greenhouse gas emissions space, of course there's a lot of talk about carbon and soil carbon. Mm -hmm. That is obviously critical. We are also taking a special look at the role of nitrogen and the role of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer sure. over application as a leading cause of nitrous oxide emissions and a leading cause of nitrate sort of leaching into groundwater and soil and seeing what we can do to invest in solutions that will minimize that. I think that's special in what Oatly Absolutely. is doing. I think on the ecosystem health side, again, we're very focused on water quality um, and the reduction of synthetic inputs that will sort of start to rebuild the quality of water and soils in the systems. And then I think the final piece that's really special is we've really thought a lot about what farmers would need from a company like Oatly. Mm -hmm. um, I heard one of the previous speakers talk about the fact that you don't just want to replicate the sort of commodity subsidy system that's gotten us to the right. place that we're in now. And I agree with that. So at the same time, we're asking farmers to take risks, to break up the system that they know and to experiment with it. We have to help support that risk. Like yeah. that's expensive and that's a risky proposition. It puts their insurance at risk, it puts their bank loans at risk. So we need to be part of helping to like lower that risk level. And we're looking at ways, and I'm the first one to say we don't have an answer to this yet, but we're in conversation about this. We know that American farm families are aging out. We know that it's very, very difficult to pass a farm down from generation to generation. We'd like to be part of keeping farmland in farm yeah. families and supporting that intergenerational viability. How, you know, how to do that exactly is something we are trying to co-create right now with our partners. So those are the special pieces, I think, of Oatly's yeah. definition. Well, one of the things that I find so interesting about regenerative agriculture as it, it, is that it's both a practice, and you talked about a lot of the practices, but it's also this philosophy. Yes. It's this different way of thinking, and you alluded to that. Can you talk about you know how yeah. we need to think about our food systems differently, especially right now? It's not just the pandemic. We have a biodiversity loss crisis. We have a climate crisis. We have a water crisis. All of these things are sort of coming to a head. Yeah, that's right. And I think it's probably because they're all kind of pieces of the same crisis, yeah. which is that we're not 
you know, in harmony with the world, which sounds a little woo-woo. Like, we're not making use of the sort of system's attributes that characterize sort of the ecology and, and human's relationship with, with people on the planet. You know, where we started was sort of with this term of sustainability, right? And I think that most people recognize now that, you know, sustainable got us a certain way right. down that road. Right. But it's, you know, sort of, a do, that's like a do no harm principle. Like, don't mess it up. Right, right, right. And we're at the point now where that's not good enough, right? right? I mean, we, so the concept of regeneration is can we create something that's more holistic, that's more healthy, that's more positive with whatever values you want to associate to that right. than where we started before. And that is because we need this corrective action for the damage that's been done. That's absolutely. how I think about it, at least. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess my, that leads into my next question. So Oatly is a very special company in a lot of different ways, but how can other companies sort of follow this model, follow this lead? I, you, there's so much to learn from what you do um, and what Oatly does. There's so much to learn from what some of the companies we've already heard from over South by, not just here, but at South by Southwest over the, this, you know, this week and last. What, how can companies sort of take this on? Yeah. I think it's a great question, and I do. I mean, thank you for saying that Oatly is a special company. I think so. <laughs> I think so. Um, but I think we are among the group of companies that is not, like, we're not a part of big food and trying to make what big food produces, like, slightly less bad. Sure. We're actually trying to make something that from out of the gate is a positive contribution to society that is a solution to the problem. There are many companies like that. We all source ingredients, we all produce products, and we all sell those to consumers. So folks can easily, I think, you know, and certain companies are taking on this model. But, you know, even large companies that sometimes they're harder ships to steer. Um, I mean, I think a lot of my colleagues in, in bigger f food companies, you know, Mars was um, mentioned earlier, are taking on aspects of working with farmers mm -hmm. and working to sort of, you know, promote systems that are going to work for them, but that are at the end of the day going to produce crops that the companies themselves can buy. Right, so. and again, making farmers and farming a more viable, less risky occupation. I think that's a huge part of this. You mentioned farmers aging before. We want to make this an attractive you know, lifestyle for, for, for folks. Yeah, I mean, I have a t huge amount of respect. I mean, you know this about me personally. I, um, during the year of the pandemic 2020, um, actually went and worked for five months as a farmhand on an organic farm because I thought I need to understand how this food is being produced and I want to be part of, you know, producing healthy food yeah. for people in a moment of real food system crisis. Right. And it was, you know, and I also, I heard your colleague from Driscoll's say earlier, you know, we need to stop thinking about farm work as unskilled labor. It's right. hugely skilled labor. I was bad at it. Um, I tried really hard. <laughs> And like no amount of sort of goodwill and, you know, whatever, intent. I didn't have those skills. I right. have a huge amount of respect for people who do. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm the same way. I've worked on farms, but I am not as good as, as farmers and never will be. So, I, you know, I, I want to go back to, you know, how other companies can learn from, from you. And we've had a lot of conversations about a spirit of cooperation. Yeah. And, and do you think that's really possible? I absolutely think it's possible, I, and I think it's actively happening. I mean, I sit in a lot of pre-competitive, you know, collaborations with like-minded companies, and I will say there is a communal spirit in those conversations that I was very pleasantly surprised to find. Um, we talk all the time. I, we share sort of technical criteria. We share frameworks. We ask each other questions. It's a space really of, of openness and trust, and, and I think it's because there's a cadre of us working on sustainability in these spaces who are genuinely mission committed. Like, we really want to get this change done. So, you know, we pull out the stops to help each other. Yeah. So I do. I mean, I, I think that that's a really um, doable thing. I'm wondering what your thoughts on are on what's driving what we're seeing right now and this cultural awareness of food systems, um, the idea that we can create more equitable food systems, which, I mean, five years ago, nobody was talking about that in quite the same way we are now. There were certain people, and, and I, I want to give my hat off to them, but in regular conversations, especially among white folks, and I just have to, like, call it out, that was, we were not concerned about the equity part of this. Yeah. I mean, I can point to a lot of different things, and certainly, I mean, I, I think I'm one of those people that was thinking about this, you know, a while ago. I, you know, food is just one of these things that people have very strong feelings, memories, emotions, associations to, and because of that, it's such a powerful tool. I mean, the whole reason I work in the food space is because I, I come out of the conservation side of the house. Like, I was a biodiversity conservationist, I worked on natural resources, 
And I came to the conclusion that food was one of the most powerful tools that we had to have that conversation with people and to make it very, very clear to people um, what role they had to play mm -hmm. in like a crisis in the Amazon or, you know, whatever, overfishing in, you know, the South Indian Ocean, whatever it is. Um, I just think there is a power and a resonance in food that everybody feels, even if they're not actively thinking about it. Right. And what's changed, you know, sort of more specifically to your question, I, I just, I think that with the world in crises, plural, whether that's pandemic or war or, you know, the, all the supply chain disruptions, people were forced to think about it in ways that they didn't before. And I think as soon as you pick your head up and start thinking about my food, why don't I have it? Is it good for me? How am I feeling? All these questions sort of surface. And then, you know, you go down the rabbit hole and you Absolutely. find really interesting things. It's a big rabbit hole, too. <laughs> One of the questions I have is, you know, I think about all kinds of farmers and um, dairy farmers have really, really struggled yeah. over the last several years in the United States and I'm sure other parts of the world, but I more, know more specifically about the United States. And I'm wondering, you know, there's, for, for, for a lot of dairy farmers, they want to transition to something else. They're, they're not happy. They're not making enough money. Um, um, they don't like how they have to treat cows or they don't like being part of a, a commodity system. How can a company like Oatly, you know, talk to a dairy farmer in a way that's non-confrontational and, and help them think about making a transition? Yeah. I mean, that's a difficult question. So I'm glad that you're asking it because let's not pretend that that's, you know, not in the room sure. with us. I mean, I, first I want to make clear that, you know, our, our issue has never been with farmers. You know, of we course. see farmers as sort of enmeshed in a system that is not serving them. Um, and our issue is with, you know, big industrial dairy, right? Because it has all of these effects of concentrating animals. And, you know, I mean, we don't have to go through the litany of sort of negative impacts of that system. Um, I think what I would say is, you know, many of the farmers who grow oats also grow like feed for livestock and they're, you know, sort of diversified in what they grow. That's, I mean, I'm not saying that they shouldn't be doing that. Sure. I think the conversation to have is what does the farmer sort of want out of that experience? I, I was in Iowa a couple months ago um, at a farmer conference that was sponsored by one of our partners there. And so many of the farmers said to me, we love the fact that we are now growing food for people. Mm. It's really important to us that we know, like, there's a product on the shelf that I can show my family. I grew for this. I'm creating food that has this value. Yeah. So I feel like there's, a, there's common ground among us, and we're just going to build on that common ground. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's not going to be a 100% overlap, but I do, I think it is very important just to restate that I think... This, the agricultural system, particularly in this country, has not sar served those families well, and that needs to change so that they can actually farm the way that they know how to farm. How can we change that? Why hasn't it served them? Why have we forgotten them? I mean, I, you know, if there was an easy answer, I, you, somebody would have said it already. I, I do think there are incentives in the system. There is, I mean, you know, we know this, that back in the 50s, the sort of go big or go home kind yeah. of mentality took over. I think that has certainly, you know, improved at least in the short term yield at the expense of lots of other things. So I think the combination of government policy, financial incentives, the complexity of figuring out a more complex system and how you parse that out economically has all been really challenging. So I just think now we have tools that can handle that complexity in ways that we couldn't before and we can, we can work on it, you know, sort of in a more integrated fashion. That's such an important point because I think in the past we've looked at things as like silver bullets, like, okay, a policy will fix this, a practice will fix this. Now we understand, and, and you, you started the conversation like this, we need this more holistic vision that incorporates all of those tool sets. Yeah, I agree with you. And, but I, at the same time, I do think it's important to call out the specific things. Like, there are policies in place from the government that are perverse incentives, right? Sure. Like, fossil fuel um, is subsidized. You know, these artificial sort of inputs are subsidized. Commodity crops are subsidized. Like, all of that is not accidental, right? Like, that's, right. that's been there. That's part of the system. Those things need to change. And I think, you know, we as a company have been saying for a while, like, it's not a level playing field for plant-based companies, and it's not a level playing field for farmers who want to farm that way. I think, you know, that's something we can call out. But I also think, again, you know, back to the reason we're having this conversation is 
you know, we're a company that wants to be part of that solution. So part of doing that is just creating markets, create, getting out there, having customers be more familiar with our product and letting customers help drive the system through the choices that they're making. Absolutely, they're absolutely. And, you know, a company like Oatly is showing up at, you know, places where policy decisions are being made. You were at COP26. I'm sure you'll be at COP27. You're in these debates, and I'm sure somebody with a sort of a, a government background is seeing things unfold that the rest of us aren't. I mean, I think we feel like it's important to be in those conversations. We're a very small company. I mean, yeah. I have a team of three people. <laughs> so it's not, I mean, I don't want anyone to imagine right. this sort of massive, you know, group of people. Um, I think we're in those conversations because we think it's important for people to hear the voice that we think that we're raising. I do feel like between, you know, COP maybe, but UN food system, I mean, you and I had a conversation about the UN global food system. Things are moving. And right. I think that part of the reason things are moving is because companies like us are saying, you need to move faster. Right. Like, we want to be there. We want to be part of this. But like other pieces, particularly those policy pieces, they have to accelerate. So we're well, pushing that. And I think we're seeing some traction. Let's talk about this urgency. I, I was on a panel recently with Julia Collins from Planet Forward. And she's like, we have 100 months. Mm. to solve the climate crisis. There is a real urgency here. And I have a lot of hope. I have a lot of optimism. But there is a real, real urgency here. And can you talk about that? Because the private sector sometimes moves very fast, sometimes moves very slow. Yeah. I mean, we are one of those com companies that is trying to scale and grow as fast as we can. Um, you know, we've opened, I think, three new factories in the last year. Wow. We built factories in the middle of COVID, and we did it safely so that none of our employees were at risk. Um, we have been, you know, on a year-on-year -year sort of orders of magnitude growth trajectory, and that's intentional. Like, that is part of the impact mission. So, you know, for us, our big sort of north star is the conversion of dairy drinkers to oat, in our case. Um, and we've sort of set a 2025 milestone for that of converting, like, I think it's 2.9 billion liters of dairy product to oat, which we estimate will save about 2.5 million um, tons of CO2 equivalent emissions. <laughs> 2.9 billion liters of product converted away from dairy towards Oatly will save, we estimate, about 2.5 million carbon ton, uh, million tons of CO2e. Wow. So in order to achieve that, and that's 2025, right? We're in 2022. Yeah. So like, yeah. yes, there's a rush. Um, but to get that done implies an accelerated pace of change yeah. and it implies a really aggressive growth. So I, you know, I heard again, someone else, I think it was Shana earlier, like that growth is an intentional sort of scaling strategy. That's part of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we have a few minutes left and I, I want to end on something that I used to ask on my podcast, everyone, what makes them hopeful right now. You have such this, you have like this incredibly diverse background. You have so much perspective from all of these different sort of places and levers. What actually gives you hope? You know, I probably would have given you a different answer a year ago, and I think you might have asked me this question a year ago. I, what's giving me hope right now is what I'm hearing from farmers that I'm talking to. I have met a lot of farmers in the last year when we finally have been able to go out and travel again who are excited about trying new things on the farm, who feel confident enough in the market and the consumer interest to take that risk, mm. who feel open to partnering with like a weird company like Oli that, you know, maybe in Iowa they didn't know who we were sure. a few years ago. Um, I think there's a level of entrepreneurialism and a level of, I think, change in the way that young farmers are educated right. so that what they're learning to do on the farm looks very, very different maybe than what it did a generation ago. And I am finding that really inspiring. And I, I wonder, you know, because this is the Future of Food conference, how does technology figure into what Oatly is doing? Yeah, it's a great question. And honestly, I think we're still figuring it out. We know, for example, that under our regenerative farming framework, we have certain outcomes that we would like to measure quantitatively, um, and we will need a set of tools to do that. So we've been you know, looking around at the various sort of traceability tools, um, using machine learning, using you know, a lot of the machinery on farms that, that registers data, some remote data, um, and then you know, the sort of I mean, I'm a social scientist, so to me, like, the farmer survey and conversation also yields really important sort of qualitative data and putting that all together so that we can track progress. Absolutely. I, I also want to talk about the, what I appreciate about you and about the company is this participatory nature that you have going on with farmers. There's a lot of, like, 
talking and feedback and talking and feedback. That doesn't happen with a lot of companies. I mean, I do think it's in the DNA of Oatly, and I love it. I mean, we also do the same kind of conversation with consumers. Like, people know where to find us. And I was at dinner last night, and someone said, oh, I was, you know, fangirling about Oatly, and I said something, and someone wrote me back. Oh, nice. And I said, yeah, I think that was either, like, uh, you know, Ali or Paula or Chelsea, because they're three <laughs> actual real people that I work with who will, you know, get back to you. I mean, we just, that's just who we are. It's, yeah. That's, that's an easy, I don't want to say easy because it takes work, but like that's just an inherent part of who this company is. We want to have honest conversations and we're also the first people to say like, okay, we didn't get it perfect. We're great. trying. Here's what happened. Here's what went great. Here's what didn't went great, you know, go great. And do people have some ideas for us? So Absolutely. we welcome that. I love the honesty. I love the bluntness. <laughs> I love the ability to recognize when you've done good and when you haven't done good. And it's, it's a really, again, it's a very special company. I'm biased. But I want to thank you, Julie, for all of your work and, and being here at South by Southwest. It's been a pleasure to work with you. Thank you so much. It was so fun to be here. Take care. Thank you. We're going to get a picture.